Let me, let me welcome everyone um, to the lobby of the State House for yet another historic occasion. Um, we're all about history in this building as well as the history that is made every day in this building and the history to come. And today we're, we're doing something rather important and that is to acknowledge that for, oh, roughly 180 years, women have been very much a part of this building, but they have not exactly been playing um, the same way that men have played in the State House. And we're here to inaugurate a new exhibition in the main lobby that we hope tells that story, truthfully tells the story of how women have attempted to be a part of this building long before the past 100 years when they actually have been part of the politics of this building. And we're here to inaugurate that story. We want you to spend a fair amount of time reading it, looking at it, appreciating it, and then getting back to the state curator's office with any comments um, that it may uh, prompt. Um, and we have a wonderful little list of people who are going to help us celebrate today. And at the very top of that list, of course, is the governor himself, Phil Scott. Sorry. Okay, there you go. Is that okay? That's and that's about all I have to say. <laughs> well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for having me. It's uh, great to be here for this dedication. You know, the State House is not only home of state government, but it's the people's house. And it has been a museum from the very start. That's important because the museums tell stories. And uh, the stories of this place, naturally, uh, revolve around our people and our politics. However, an unfortunate part of this story is that throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, men took center stage in state government, making the decisions within this building and buildings like it across the state, or country, I should say. It was not until the 19th Amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution 100 years ago that finally gave women the right to vote and to enter the state as lawmakers. And make no mistake, this was a result of hard work and commitment of women across the state and country advocating day in and day out for, for women's suffrage. People like my grandmother, who lived on a farm in nearby Plainfield and was a proud and loyal member of the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Today, we celebrate the achievements of these advocates and female trailblazers across the state and in this state house. I want to thank those women who blazed the trail all those years ago and to each of the legislators who carry that torch today. And I'm pleased to be surrounded by many of you this afternoon. It's fitting that we mark this occasion in the same week when we saw Katie Sowers make history when she became the first woman to coach in the Super Bowl. I heard her say that all it takes is one, and it opens the door to so many. And that's so true. And when I think about my two daughters, I want to thank all those women who have been the one who opened more opportunities for my girls and for all women. In the Vermont legislature, that one woman was Edna Beard, Vermont's first woman legislator. In the executive branch, it was Governor Madeline Kunin and Lieutenant Governor Consuela Bailey. And in our highest court, it was Denise Johnson, Vermont's first female Supreme Court Justice. And while it takes just one to open the door, 
it takes many to widen it. So again, I want to thank the speaker, Majority Leaders Ballant and Krewinski, Minority Leader McCoy, Dean of the House, my friend, Representative Emmons, and so many others serving with them today and who served in the past for showing young girls around the state what they can achieve. Every one of you is helping to move the, the needle to bring more gender parity to the State House and to our work. So I thank you for that. Because we've come a long ways in 100 years, but not far enough yet. In closing, I want to acknowledge the many people who contributed to this project, including David Sheets and the Curator's Office, Friends of the State House, the Historical Society, the State Ar Archives and Records Administration, and so many more. This is an important issue to celebrate and again, I thank you all for being here today. And now, Vermont's third woman Speaker of the House, Mitzi Johnson. incredibly proud of the title Madam Speaker. <laughs> now here's a quiz. 50 states, about two weeks ago, um, because of changes in two other states, we hit a historic high of the number of Madam Speakers in state houses across the country. Think to yourself, don't clap just yet. <laughs> How many is that? Eight. Good job, sir. Thank you for noting. Eight, eight out of 50 is the high that we are celebrating. I'm not okay celebrating 16%. And while it takes that one woman to be the first, it takes systemic changes so that others can follow. On the House floor today, we uh, clarified campaign law so that, so that you could use campaign expenditures for child and dependent care. Vermont is the last state in the country that has never sent a woman to Washington. And when we, when we look at um, members of Congress and the U.S. Senate, the vast majority of them started in politics before they were 35, which means we need to make sure that women in their teens and 20s and early 30s have the support they need from their community, from their partners, from their employer to both take care of the family that they share, many of them with men, <laughs> and also take care of the world around them by running for office, by being leaders in the business sector, by becoming members of the Supreme Court. I am thrilled to celebrate the women that have gotten us here. I am thrilled to own this title of Madam Speaker at this point in history. And we need to all work together on the systemic changes necessary for true equality. Because if 100 years gets us to 16%, we got to pick up the pace, folks. <laughs> Thank you. Speaking for the Senate, the President Pro Tem, Tim Ash. Well, thank you, David, and I think um, it's a really powerful, just like when we created um, the uh, exhibit about Abenakis, which is just off to that corner, which was really the first time this building acknowledged people who were here long before people came to settle from Europe and other parts of the world. 
what we start with today, and this is really a starting point, is a rather modest but important first recognition of the influence that women have had in this building. And I think it's just in the last two days, we've had hundreds of students from across the state walking through the hallways. If they were walking through almost any corridor here, they would see just two or three portraits of women on the, on the walls here. I think we all know that to be true. And yet, one of the strange things is that this building, this building is not meant to be a building of governor's portraits and lieutenant governor's portraits. This is actually the legislature's building first and foremost. And I just want to briefly acknowledge the particularly outsized role women have been playing in the legislature. Now, when I first got to the Senate, we, we have what we call the money committees. So in the House, it's Ways and Means and Appropriations. In the Senate, it's Finance and Appropriations. These are called the money committees. When I arrived, all four committees were chaired by women. So four most important positions, really, in the legislature, all chaired by women. I then became the chair of finance, so I kind of became the male auxiliary of the women of money. But then I was removed from that position, so we're back to four women who chair the most important <laughs> committees in the legislature. And I think, though, that beyond that, House and Senate committee chairs for decades now have been uh, ably filled by women leaders we do not see their pictures on the wall. And I know I see uh, the chair of our institutions committee, which is in uh, charge of capital uh, activities, uh, Joe Benning. And he is interested in making sure that next year, when we see hundreds of kids coming through here, they're seeing women representation on the walls, not just the men who uh, have the white starch collars from the 1800s. So I just want to say uh, briefly what a privilege it has been to serve alongside so many very powerful, talented women in my role in the Senate. Right now, uh, it's a lot easier when you only have 30 to do uh, a quick uh, a, a list of them, but Senators Jane Kitchell, Ann Cummings, Jeanette White, Ginny Lyons, Alice Nicka, Becca Ballant, Debbie Ingram, Allison Clarkson, Ruth Hardy, and Cheryl Hooker are all women senators uh, who do such a fantastic job here, and I think that we do need to change the way this building looks so that, looking back, people will see their faces on the walls, not just those uh, guys from the 1800s. Thank you. I started my tenure as curator back in the 80s when Madeline Kunin was Vermont's first governor. I vividly remember that long after uh, Madeline left this building, in 1993, the State House did something even more monumental and unthinkable at the time. Teresa Randall was elected as the first female sergeant at arms. And I still remember that there were a lot of guys in the building who had trouble with that. They could accept a governor that was a woman, but the sergeant at arms? <laughs> and happily now, we're on to our second, and that's Janet Miller. Thank you so much. Um, I just would like to reiterate uh, the opportunity to recognize Teresa Randall. Uh, she was a sergeant at arms from 1993 to 1996, and Teresa worked for uh, Governor Coonan. And in 1993, it was very rare for a woman to be a sergeant at arms. I think maybe there was one other, but not very many. So the Vermont legislature, again, showed their confidence in a woman and elected Teresa to that position. Uh, Teresa passed away last year, and she was a mentor to me, so we had a lot of conversations of how things have changed, but sometimes things still stay the same. And I think there's still some element of surprise when someone comes up to me and says, uh, is the sergeant at arms here? And then I say, well, you're talking to her, so it's a, it's a bit of a surprise, but I think people are getting used to it. There are still maybe less than 10, I'm not sure, sergeant at arms throughout the uh, country. So it's a privilege to have that honor. Um, I'd like to just say for 25 years later, 2020, there are many women in the Vermont State House, not only our legislators, but we have administrative staff, committee staff, attorneys, 
fiscal analysts, staff, um, police officers, doorkeepers, tour guides, janitorial and cafeteria management, lobbyists, and media personnel. Those were all roles held by men previously. And now our eighth grade pages, who by the way, were all boys until about 1973, 72, early 70s. I think it would be very strange for them to be here if there weren't any women. So I'd also like to thank all of you, and I don't want to forget the men who support the women here. The Vermont State House, I think that's an important thing because we're in a lucky place to be. So thank you. Our last speaker is one that we wanted to reflect on the long picture here at the State House, the long view. And so naturally, we turn to the Dean of the House, Representative Alice Emmons. Oh boy. <laughs> Welcome. I had a really hard time figuring out what I was going to say, but let me just start by saying I was first elected back in 1982. I was 27 years old. And I thought I'd start out by giving a little bit of statistics in terms of where the women were back in 1983 and 84. That was my freshman year in this building. I was a pretty young person. And at that time, in the Senate, there were four women senators. In the House, there were 30 women in the House. Of the 30, 10 came in with me. So in 1983 is when we started seeing the trajectory of going up. At that time, we only had in the House about three chairs that were women. To this day, we have over half of our committees that are chaired by women. The other thing I looked at, too, was the division between the two parties for the women, and they were pretty evenly split. There were 14 Democratic women and 16 Republican women. So, in context, in looking at that, we have grown, but we have a tremendous way to go. We also had a women's caucus back then, and our first priority in the women's caucus was a law for, for child seats, a requirement that our children be in a car seat and not just strapped in with a seat belt. And I remember that was our, one of our first debates on the floor of the House, and that was pretty split in terms of gender, in that the men did not want to have to put a car seat in the front seat of their pickup truck to drive around the farm. That was the, le that was the debate at that point. So here we are 20 years later, and we have 10 women senators and, a, and 62 women House members. So we, we're getting there. So the other thing I noticed in terms of a woman governor, I was here when Madeline was elected, and the thing that struck me the most was Inauguration Day. It was a very soothing, and meaning, meaningful day. The Vermont Symphony was here playing, and it was just a very calm and joyful day. The inaugurations for a man governor are very, very different, and I didn't realize that until after Madeline was no longer governor. There were brass bands, there were military. It was a very, very different feel. And that's how it has changed over time, because even now with a male governor, it's a softer tone, which I think we bring to the table. And the last that I'll say, this is a little strange. <laughs> it's a little strange, 
but it shows the impact that we had back in the late 80s. We built an addition to the State House. And one of the major pieces of discussion was how many bathrooms for women, because we didn't have enough. And that was a large discussion when we did the expansion. And the other part that was really important to that were changing tables. We did not have changing tables in the State House. And we very seldom even had legislators that could bring in their children. And now that has all changed. So we've made progress. Thank you. And we have more to do. Thank you. So in, in wrapping up, I want to thank a few people who made our exhibition possible. At the very top of that list, is the assistant state curator who I am so proud is among the foremost women's historians in Vermont, Jack Zylenga. <laughs> but Jack would be the first to thank the four women historians who helped us substantially with our story telling in the exhibit. Amy Morsland, is Amy here? From Middlebury College. Um, uh, uh, Melanie Gustafson from UVM, is Melanie here? Uh, Marilyn Blackwell, um, the favorite historian here in central Vermont, Marilyn. And who am I forgetting? Yes, Karen Madden at uh, Northern Vermont University. Those four women, Jack was in regular communication with them throughout this process. And we've been working on this for a year and a half, um, at least. And in that process, we have been very substantially assisted by the curatorial task force chaired by Mary Leahy. Mary? is right over there. Um, and I see quite a few members of our task force. They are the people who are working avidly with us, starting with the Abenaki display on the other side of the lobby, to connect all Vermonters to their state house. That is our mission. We have all kinds of strategies for accomplishing that. But these exhibitions are a direct result of the work that we've done with Mary's commission. And we'll be continuing to work with them on that mission in the months and years to come, perhaps. <clears throat> Finally, the Friends of the State House. Um, they have worked with me for 40 years here at the State House to restore the building and to begin the process of acknowledging that this building is a museum and that consequently it has audiences and we need to address those audiences. You heard Tim about the school kids. We get more school children than any other site by far in Vermont and we take our mission to teach them about not only Vermont history, but civics and what is going on in this building. That is very much a part of our mission to make sure that they understand government, understand history and its place in their lives. To go forth to be citizens of Vermont. That's huge. And we are very grateful to the friends for helping us with that mission, and for throwing great parties. <laughs> so in, down that hallway is a wonderful reception that we want you to enjoy. We have also partnered with the Humanities Council, who are at the table over here. We're presenting tonight's Farmer's Night, which, where we sing the 19th Amendment to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Uh, with a wonderful assortment of singers, many of them legislators and people here in the State House. And we have Meg Mott 
is Meg here. Meg Mott is a scholar from Marlboro College, another historian, an authority on the 19th Amendment, and Meg is going to engage the Farmer's Night audience in an examination of that pivotal moment when women got the right to vote. And finally, over here, the Alliance, the Vermont Suffrage Centennial Alliance is the organization that you need to be aware of throughout the year. This is just the beginning of a whole year's worth of events that the Alliance is on top of. Visit their website, uh, the Vermont Suffrage Centennial Alliance, and you will see event after event culminating in the August 22nd observance of the actual centennial when it was ratified by, I'm sorry to say, Tennessee. the state of Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, it could have been Vermont, but it wasn't. <clears throat> You'll find out why when you examine our exhibit. And so many wonderful stories are over there, so please spend some time with the exhibit reading about the desk that is on display that both Edna Beard and Consuelo Bailey shared and how they used that desk. Um, we're very grateful to the Vermont Historical Society for making that available to us for the exhibition. Anyway, from now on, let's celebrate women Let's celebrate the empowerment of women right here in this building, and let's party on. Thank you.